him to pronounce the name because I'm sure you do it wrongly uh, to represent the company and to tell us uh, more about uh, about their project. So thank you, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Przemysław Pobrotin, or Przemek for short, and I work at Allegro, uh, one of the sponsors of, of this uh, great event. And today I want to tell you about many interesting projects uh, in machine learning that we do at Allegro. So without further, further ado, let's get right into it. So what is Allegro.pl? Because not all of you may know. Allegro is the largest Polish e-commerce marketplace. And it's been uh, operating on the Polish market since 1999, when it started as a startup, as an auctioning site. Uh, it was um, a startup based in Poznań. Now we have offices uh, throughout the country. So we re really are a household name, like every single Pole knows what Allegro is. So to give you some sort of idea of a scale at which we operate, uh, every month we have 55 million or roughly 55 million new offers being listed on the platform. We daily uh, sell more than uh, 1 million products and we have more than 225 million visits per month. So with such a scale, obviously come many uh, challenges, but also opportunities to use machine learning in production. Uh, and my idea for this talk was that it's primarily a research-oriented uh, summer school, and a lot of you are master's students or PhD students, but I guess some of you are, might be on the fence whether you should pursue a career in research or in industry. And with this talk, I want to give you some more insights into what it's like to be doing machine learning in industry with like practical applications, where the, let's say, the, the life cycle of, of your project is much quicker than in, in, in the research environment. And I want to give you this perspective through the lens of a life cycle of a product on our platform. So since its inception, so since it's listed uh, on the platform through the findability of it, so how customers uh, have different ways to look for the product they're looking for and hopefully purchase it, uh, all the way to the post-purchase support because sometimes things go wrong and we need to step in and help our customers resolve their issues. And we have a dedicated customer service uh, team for that. So at each stage of this, of this journey, there are many places where you, you can apply machine learning uh, to tirelessly work behind the scene and make the whole experience as seamless as possible for our users. So starting off with the, uh, the first step, listing an offer for sale, that should be easy, right? So you have a form to fill in, uh, give a catchy title and a description, put a nice photo of your product and off you go. Except it's, well, it is easy, but not that trivial. So here you here see a screenshot of what a seller sees uh, when he tries to list his uh, item. So I'm, I'm sorry it's in Polish, but it's an actual screenshot from the platform, which is in Polish. So uh, here we, we see that when you're listing an offer, uh, the platform suggests you a product to match with that offer. So what is the distinction between offers and products? So on the left, you see so-called offer-based view of a search result list. And on the right, you see a product-based view. So offers are each individual listings by different sellers, which might uh, be the, uh, the, the same product. So different sellers might sell the same product at perhaps a different price with different conditions, etc. And ideally, as a customer, you'd like all of these to be grouped together in what's on the right, the product-based view, when you only have individual products listed, and then once you decide on which product you're interested in, you click on that and then you see all the possible offers that are on the platform. So with slowly rolling out this sort of uh, change in, the, in the, the way the offers are presented from the offer base to product based, uh, but this view on the left when we're suggesting what is the right product to link with an offer, it's not mandatory. We, we don't want to force our sellers to, to do that just yet perhaps, uh, so we still have many offers on the platform which don't have any product link. So in order to go from the offer base to the product based view, we need to we need to have a reliable way, perhaps automatic way of matching up offers with products. So this sounds like a perfect task for machine learning, but you might be thinking this is trivial. This is just classification. You have a bunch of products and you do a classification onto them. Except it's not that easy because uh, the database of products of possible products goes into millions. And then it's updated daily. So you have new products every, pretty much every day. There are some products which are uh, about to be premiered, say a newest iPhone, which might not have any offers linked yet, but from the very first day it appears on the platform, you won't already have the right uh, links between offers and products. And you have plenty of offers for which you have no product matching. 
So instead of taking it the classification way and say retraining a classifier onto millions of classes every single day, we took a metric learning approach. So this is a quite a dense slide, so let me unpack it for you. So the way we represent offers and products is via text. So each offer and product comes with a name or a title and then a list of attributes, which are like a key value pairs where the key might be, say, a screen size of a phone and the value is the value of that screen size. So we concatenate these strings to have like one long textual description of both offers and products. Then we take a BERT network to which I'll come back in a second to embed these in a common vector space. And then we use what's known in literature as triplet loss uh, to fine tune these embeddings. So the idea behind triplet loss, if you've not heard of it, is that you have these triplets of uh, entities called anchor, positive, and negative. The anchor in, in our case is the representation of, of our offer. Positive is the representation of a matching product that is the same product as the offer. And uh, negative is the representation of a non-matching product. And then your loss encourages these representations to, to be so that the offer and the product, the matching product, the positive, are close uh, in the common embedding space, and the uh, the anchor and the negative are far apart, further than the anchor and positive, by a certain margin m, which is a hyperparameter. And you fine-tune the whole system, and you have a matching system that you can unleash onto your products and uh, do the matching uh, without the help of the sellers. Obviously, the, I, I just kind of scratched the surface here because if you've read any of the metric learning literature, you know that the way you form these triplets, it very much informs the dynamic of learning and it's a non-trivial task. So we've spent a great deal of effort into making sure this, this is as efficient as, as possible. And also let me come back to this Herbert. So obviously both offers and products are listed on the platform in Polish. So we had to deal with Polish text. And just like there are loads of uh, models being published on, say, Hugging Face, mentioned by Łukasz yesterday, uh, for English language, there aren't so many available for the Polish language. And at the time when we were starting the, this project, none of the, uh, none of the models available were, were quite making it for us. So we decided to train our own uh, BERT called Herbert, and also fine tune it our, on our own internal data set to better match the vocabulary, the type of vocabulary you get in, in an e-commerce platform. But as we were uh, kind of going through the literature for BERT and many variants of how we can train it, we've realized uh, we need like a reliable way of evaluating are we making progress or not. And for English language, you have these two benchmark, uh, benchmarks called glue and super glue, which are a collection of tasks uh, that you can benchmark your models against. And you have like a very clear indication of whether you're going in the right direction or not. But no such benchmark was available for Polish. So what we decided to do is to create one. Uh, so we collected a number of tasks that were already kind of scattered across literature for the Polish language, uh, introduced a new task called Allegro Reviews, which is a sentiment analysis on the product reviews from our platform, put it all together in a nice leaderboard, and we named this benchmark Clay, which is a tongue-in-cheek name because Clay means actually glue in Polish, but it also is uh, short for, in, in Polish, comprehensive list of uh, language evaluations. Uh, so this work is actually, as we speak, being presented at the ACL conference, which is now online as pretty much everything this year. Uh, and you can also read the details of our work uh, on archive. The paper is called Clay Comprehensive Benchmark for Polish Language Understanding. It um, includes both the description of the benchmark as well as our Polish BERT model. And we're very happy to see that the model was, uh, the, the benchmark was very quickly adapted by the Polish community. And as you can see, our Herbert model currently ranks eighth. So we're working on the second version of it to kind of beat the, beat the benchmark we, we established ourselves. Um, so once we have products on the platform, obviously the key ingredient of any e-commerce marketplace is a search engine. You need to have a reliable way of finding the product you're looking for. And this is a very well-known problem in literature, perhaps not so prominent in machine learning courses, but nonetheless uh, a workhorse of many search engines in the industry. Uh, the kind of overall framework in machine learning is called learning to rank. Uh, and we do have a learning to rank system that we've been working on for the number of years to, to, to deploy it in production. It currently serves uh, all the search traffic that goes through Allegro. 
So what we have is a XGBoost ranking model, which is uh, learned on the search logs, so on the click-through data uh, that users leave in the live system. So there's no uh, like manual annotation. The labels are implicit, so we have plentiful data from you know all the millions of products sold every day, and we train a ranking system to which. Uh, so as a maybe short introduction for those of you who don't know what learning to rank is and never heard the term. The difference between learning to rank and say classification or, or regression is that instead of having a single item as input, you have like a group of items as input of, of vectorized entities. And your goal is to sort them in a way that maximizes certain utility for the user. Uh, in our case, it's the click probability. You may think of it this way. Um, so this is all fairly standard, but recently we've been thinking about, uh, since we're using XGBoost, uh, it's kind of most suited for tabular kind of data. And we do have like tabular, tabular kind of features like uh, seller quality, the price, uh, popularity of an item, things like that. But we wanted to also have ways of including like an image of, of an item or its title uh, as a feature in our ranking model. So the way we decided to go about that is again, use a triplet loss where our triplets are, are formed so that your anchor is a vectorized search phrase, again, say using BERT. Uh, then your positive is a, an image vectorized with, with a CNN or a title of, a, of an offer vectorized with the same BERT or any other modality you can come up with. Um, uh, and, and this pair is positive if that offer with that image was clicked for a given search phrase in, in a given search. And it's a negative pair if that offer wasn't clicked in that search or comes from an entirely different search. We uh, kind of mix in 35% of these so-called global negatives. And we found them to regularize the training very well. So this way you again embed both your search phrase, the user search phrase, and some kind of multimodal description of your offer in the common embedding space, fine tune the whole thing with triplet loss. And then how do we include that in the downstream task? So in the ranking process, uh, say when you want to rank uh, an item online and there's a search phrase uh, requested by the user, you vectorize it on the fly. You already have a pre-vectorized, say, images of all the offers on Allegro. You compute the similarity, excuse me, in the vector space. So like a um, cosine distance of, of these vectors. And this one float that you get, it's an extra feature in your ranking system. And believe it or not, it actually works pretty well. And as we speak, we're trying to roll it out to as many, to cover as many categories uh, in Allegra as possible and kind of working on enhancing that further. So uh, this prompted us to thinking that this whole process is a bit cumbersome because we have the entire new neural metric learning process that only serves to create like one feature uh, for our ranking. It's not very scalable. And obviously we would like to learn everything end to end. So in a, uh, so we would like to have a neural ranking model as well. And as we were looking through the literature, we found that pretty much the only approaches people were using at the time uh, were fully connected networks for ranking, which weren't quite making it in the ranking scenario. So we decided that perhaps the problem here is that with the fully connected network, when you're scoring an item, you, you look at every single item in isolation, despite them being a group. So what's the hottest new model that looks at the group of or, or set of input items and scores them simultaneously? Where is the transformer? So we decided to use the transformer in the learning to rank setting. And we started off as a research project. And you can read the preprint that we've published some time ago. It's called Context Aware Learning to Rank with Self-Attention. Since, since then, uh, since kind of we started working on this project, there were a couple other groups I think the idea was ripe in the community and uh, simultaneously a couple other people pretty much did the same. We also had a poster at this very school where Mikowai, the third author of the paper, was presenting this work. So you can still go back to the recording and check it out if you're interested. And also as part of this effort, we've uh, open sourced uh, a library called AllRank, which is uh, our kind of PyTorch based library for neural learning to rank. So if you're interested in this sort, in this sort of stuff, go to the, our GitHub and do check it out. So once you have um, you, you have your products on the platform, you have a way of discovering them. But sometimes this still won't make it because people are looking for something extremely specific that is very hard to describe in words, like this this particular fancy dress with this particular pattern that you don't even know how to how to call it. So for these sort of use cases, 
uh, we've designed a visual search engine, which is currently in its beta tests. Uh, so a select group of a small select group of uh, kind of most heavy Allegro users are testing it at the moment. So the idea is pretty simple. You have your user who wants to say find this particular shoes or dress or some other fashion item. They take a picture. It goes through a CNN model and gets vectorized. Everything else is already vectorized with the same model. You have the uh, approximate nearest uh, nearest neighbor search index. You retrieve the most similar offers. You present them to the user. That's uh, kind of the theory of how to design such a system. It sounds easy enough. In practice, obviously, it's quite difficult to make it robust and actually giving you the type of offers you're looking for. But let me tell you a few more details on how we approach the design of it. So we started off with a triplet loss approach as in all the previous projects because it, it's been working for us so well. So there's an entire big story on how to actually create these triplets uh, well because on the platform, most of the uh, pictures of products are like studio quality, wide background, professionally made with professional grade lighting, lighting. Whereas people who actually then use the product, they have their, their old smartphone in a dimly lit room uh, with, the, with whatever else there is in the background. So uh, to kind of create triplets which, which allow the model to learn this sort of relations was not a trivial task. And we kind of had to be quite uh, clever with the heuristics on how we create the data set from the vast amounts of data we, we have at, at Allegro. Then we vectorize these pictures with a ResNet 101 or any other CNN you, you, you want. And then as we were experimenting with various loss functions, various architectural choices, we decided that for this particular uh, task, better than triplet loss is what's called a large margin cosine loss. Uh, you can think of it as a ranking loss on a batch of items, very roughly speaking. But I, I in, uh, invite you to read the cost phase paper from 2018 which introduces the loss if you're interested in the details. Another thing we found out is that oftentimes these CNNs are biased for texture. So if you take a picture, say, of a checkered shirt, you might uh, get returned a checkered skirt and not shirts. And that's not something that our users would appreciate. So we added an extra classification head, which predicts the category of an item. So then you have these kind of uh, loss function, which is a sum of two different losses. So instead of weighing them by hand and deciding like a, what's the appropriate mixture of the two losses, we again use the idea from the paper, multitask learning using uncertainty to weigh losses for scene geometry and semantics. Well, we applied it for visual search and it allows us to learn the parameters, the, the kind of the, the weighing, uh, the weights of each loss automatically as a part of the learning process. So all together, again, you fine tune the, these embeddings, put them in the FISE index, and you have your visual search. And again, just to, I want to point out that it, it, as easy it may sound, as it may sound, as there are many technical details, nitty gritty details that need to uh, be ironed out to make it really robust and reliable in, in the wild. And it's something we've been working on for quite a while now. Uh, so, People uh, can now find the products in many different ways and hopefully they make the purchase. But every now and again, things go wrong. And we do have our customer support team, which every day receives thousands of emails that they respond to. Sometimes they need to, they need to have like a tailor tailored response. Sometimes, sometimes they can use a template, but in any case, we do have humans actually reading these emails and deciding what's the best course of action. And uh, this looks like a perfect opportunity for machine learning to step in and uh, and help these people make their work more efficient. So uh, again, the way we went about that is if we if you remember, we already had this uh, Allegro bird or Herbert as we called it. Uh, by the way, it's called Herbert um, as an homage to a late Polish poet, poet Herbert. Uh, so we fine-tuned it again on, on the uh, corpus of the emails that are exchanged between our customers and our customer um, support team. 
And as you may or may not know, in the regular training of BERT, you have these two objectives. You have the masked language model um, objective, where you predict the mi missing tokens. But you also have the next sentence prediction uh, objective, where given a pair of sentences, you need to decide uh, is one sentence the consecutive of the other or not. And uh, we substituted that objective with what we call a next email uh, objective. So you have these threads of email exchanges, and you need to decide do these two emails come from the same thread or not. We dubbed that model Mailberg. It's internal, and sadly, it's not uh, published. Uh, and we can use that model to embed all the emails that come in to us uh, into a common vector space. But we don't really have any labels for these. So th these are just some points in the vector space. And we would like to discover some kind of groups or intents that people are writing with to us so that we can then propose some automatic replies to these groups of emails. But as already was described uh, in the unsupervised learning talk, a couple of days ago, when you want to do this sort of unsupervised learning, you need to make choices because you need to kind of put your, your own bias, let's say, into it somehow. So what we decided to do, the choices we made, is that we, uh, for some groups of answers, there, there were already, uh, like the people responding to these emails were using templates, uh, and it was easy to identify uh, or partially label some of the data and create some groups uh, of, of emails that go together. And then using the mailbird described uh, previously and these partially labeled examples, we again turn to triplet loss to fine tune the embeddings. And in fact, we weren't fine tuning the embeddings of the emails coming from customers, but the responses to these emails because ev and no email goes unresponded to. So every email has an answer, and these answers are typically written more concisely and more repeatedly to one another. So by grouping the responses, you in fact, you're obtaining a grouping of the emails that are attached to these responses. So uh, once you fine tune your bird, the, the, these representations are kind of well behaved enough that your regular old k-means can do a pretty decent job at clustering them. But an important thing here is that when we discover these partial labels, we knew that a priori that they're not going to cover all possible topics. So by doing this clustering, not only do we recover the labels we already knew about, but we also kind of create new groups that we can then manually check and realize are they kind of actually coherent groups or not. And if they are, we can just turn these into labels and then, uh, yeah, sorry. And then we can train like a regular old classifier on top of these representations to just classify incoming emails into one of these groups. And then uh, you can have ready-made templates uh, already kind of uh, suggested to the people making the decision about which sort of reply goes to the user at the end of the day. Okay, so this kind of very quick will in talk of what we do uh, in Allegro is just a tip of an iceberg. This, these are just some of the projects that I find personally the most interesting that we're doing at Allegro. And all of them still need, uh, there's plenty of work to be done for each and every one of them, be it extending our kind of customer support solution to a fully fledged chatbot, or extending our visual search to serve any category of products, or making ranking or recommendations like session-based and much more personalized or actually putting into production the transformer-based ranking that I talked about earlier and many, many more ideas that, that we're discussing that, um, internally that are still ahead of us. So I hope this gave you some sort of overview of what it might be like to be working at an e-commerce company in machine learning. Uh, hopefully it got you as excited as I am about these ideas. And if you want to, uh, know more, you can reach out to me either on Rocket Chat or via email. And we're always looking for research engineers. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to apply via link on the slide. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we can spend 20% of time just doing pure research. So we do have time for like research projects as well, which resulted, say, in a publication at ACL recently, some other projects which are still kind of being uh, worked on. Uh, we have weekly seminars. We, we can find us at top uh, conferences where, where we attend uh, to, to kind of stay up to date with the, with the research. And 
yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. And also, just after the, the questions, uh, me and some other people from Allegro will be at the virtual booth in Krakow. Uh, uh, so you can talk to us there as well. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really, really interesting. So it's really interesting to see how we actually apply in practice all the all the machine learning uh, notions that, that we learn, that they really can be applied in practice. So I think we are safe to say that there will be no AI winter anytime soon coming, given the large applicability of, uh, yeah, of learning. Certainly, certainly not in Allegro. Okay, great. Uh, great. Thank you. For us. So there were some some questions. So maybe we can just go quickly through through that. Um, I will just read them. I will just read them for you, so I like the speaker. So um, Amin is asking, could you combine collaborative filtering and CNNs to to get better new recommendations? Uh, yes. So we were looking at uh, using embeddings from uh, CNNs, uh, offer embeddings as an extra signal in our recommender systems. But as far as I remember, I'm, I might not be on top of that because I don't work personally on recommendations, but I think the, the results weren't quite uh, conclusive uh, or rather weren't good enough to justify going fully fledged into production with that. But certainly, yeah, we were trying doing that. Okay. What framework do you use to train uh, the deep learning models? Uh, we mostly work in Pytorch at the moment. Yeah. Okay. And one more question: Since you have both textual and visual data, do you do any research in on mul in multimodal in a multimodal fashion? Uh, so at the moment, we actually yeah we, we work quite heavily for multimodal uh, models in ranking, but they're not research oriented; they're, they're mostly production oriented. But we do see such ideas being described in like a more uh, industry oriented conferences like KDD or SIGIR in like uh, industry tracks. So. Maybe if time allows, we'll write it up at some point, our, our findings, and, and also try and kind of go the research way with it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Definitely Allegro seems like a great place to work. It's it's really impressive that you also publish. So that, that is really, really great. So yeah, uh, please join uh, join Premislav in, uh, in the networking rooms uh, to find out more about the about the, the careers opportunities that they have uh, at Allegro. So again,